Okay, back again to some ray trace uh, problems, and this time we're going to uh, consider the influences of a couple assumptions that we've been making. Uh, one of the assumptions that we made is that the uh, layers in the subsurface have successively higher velocity. That's a reasonable assumption, you know, maybe in most cases. It, it really depends on the geology, though. If you're in a geological environment where uh, you have uh, uh, layers undergoing compaction, then generally the velocity is going to increase as you go to greater depths. Uh, and this can carry over once, it's, once these uh, intervals are lithified. So uh, very often we do see this, uh, in general, we see an increase in velocity with depth. But the question that we're considering here is what happens if we have a velocity inversion? And that's the case where V2, we have a layer sandwiched in there that we didn't see that has a velocity uh, V2, which is less than V1, and V3. So that's one assumption that we're making and one problem that we need to consider. And another assumption that we make is that the refraction from the top of the layer, that we're actually going to see it. And this may not be the case if the layer that's sandwiched between two uh, layers, even though the velocity is increasing, if that layer is just uh, too thin. So we don't, we don't see it. So this is referred to as the layer too thin problem. So we have the velocity inversion problem here. We have the layer too thin problem. And let's take a look at the velocity inversion problem first. So here with velocity inversion, uh, just to use this as an example, we've got uh, two layers. They have thickness of 4 meters and 3 meters. But here we have a second layer which has a velocity which is less than V1 and less than V3. So we aren't going to see a critical refraction from this interface because the velocity is actually going down. What happens is that the ray path then refracts towards the normal. We have a theta 2 less than theta 1. And we actually have to go out a little bit further in order to get that uh, critical re refraction. So there is no critical refraction from the top of layer 2 out along here. Uh, it's simply refracted. And so what we see when we collect our, when we look at our shot data, is we see the direct arrival, uh, the ray that's the wave that's traveling directly out along the surface with velocity V1 between the source and the receiver. And that's how we get our V1. Uh, then we see the critical refraction from the base of layer 2. And it's traveling with uh, the velocity V3 and has the slope 1 over V3. So this would be the data then that you would be analyzing and you come up with a, an incorrect answer for the depth to this refractor. Since you don't know that this uh, um, lower velocity layer is actually sandwiched in there. So the question is how uh, will that affect your result? Uh, in the, and if we pursue a typical two-layer uh, analysis, and so what an approach that we might take would be to use the time intercept. We, we assume that we can see the uh, uh, critical refraction. We follow that over. We get the intercept. Um, so what would the time intercept be? Well, we need to undertake the actual analysis, uh, assuming, you know, it, the, the critical refraction is going to come in at a time that's going to be influenced uh, by the presence of the second layer. So we have to calculate theta 1. We have to calculate theta critical. That would be this angle, uh, theta 2, at the value where theta 3 becomes equal to pi over 2, so that we have uh, theta critical is equal to v2 over v3. We take the inverse sine of that. And, uh, and then the critical refraction, the uh, critical refraction from the base of layer 2 will actually have travel times that uh, uh, have um, the length of the ray paths divided by the velocity and the media which they're traveling. So we have 
the downward and upward uh, segments, so we have a factor of 2 in here, remember. So we have 2d1 over v1 plus 2d2 over v2, and then we have the uh, path along the interface, which is the total source receiver offset minus twice the projections of the ray paths onto the interface. So we have minus 2L1 minus 2L2 over V3. Now the intercept is the value um, that we would have when X is equal to 0. So this would be the intersection of the critical refraction if we were to extend it over to the time axis uh, at X equals 0. And that is just simply going to be these terms without the X. So this is our time intercept. Now, D1 is going to be 6.1, D2 is going to be 3.64. If we calculate the uh, critical, if we calculate the intercept uh, time for the critical refraction, extend that over to the x equals 0 the, to the time axis, we get 0 0.00296 seconds. So very, these are thin layers, so the arrival time is very, uh, very early. So this would be a shallow high resolution uh, refraction survey that we'd be conducting. Uh, we're, again, we're using the angles that we compute, assuming that we actually know a V1 and a V2. We get our V1 though in our shot record. We don't really, we don't see a critical refraction here uh, for, from the second layer, and then we see the critical refraction from the uh, interface between layers 2 and 3. So we're proceeding in ignorance of the layer with the lower velocity. And using uh, that in the following formula, we would infer from the observations that the thickness of the layer would actually be 9.03 meters, 9.03 meters thick. Now, we haven't talked too much about this, but remember that uh, we, we can see the reflection event in here, but very often for short offsets, uh, the reflections uh, are kind of hidden behind the air wave and the ground roll. So we don't always see everything that we'd like to see in here that might be a giveaway to the uh, problem that we have. Uh, however, you, you often do see the critical refractions, and even if you don't see the uh, point of tangency or the minimum offset uh, distance, you can extrapolate those over and get an intercept and then solve the problem. So we do have a V1 and a V3. We approach the calculation of the thickness of the layer using this formula uh, for the two-layer case. So we get a little over 9 meters when we actually only have 2 meters. The 4,000 meter per second velocity It's higher than the average velocity completely ignores the fact that there's a lower velocity layer in there. And using the single layer formula, uh, we get an estimate of uh, 9 meters, 9.03 meters. So we overestimate the thickness of the layer by 2 meters. And that's about a 30% error. So the presence of the velocity inversion delays the, reflect, the refraction from interface 2 and it leads us to overestimate its depth. We've also entirely missed the second layer and we overestimate the thickness because we incorrectly assume that the refraction event travels from the surface all the way down to the refractor with a velocity of 4,000 meters per second. So, so that's the issue with the velocity inversion problem. Now this is the layer too thin problem. <coughs> Now with the layer too thin problem, we've got resolvable ref refractions. We get a, a V1, V2, and a V3. Uh, we can see the uh, critical refraction from the base of uh, uh, base of layer one. We can see the critical refraction from the base of layer two. No problem. We would treat this as a two-layer problem, and uh, and we we shouldn't have any issues with that. Uh, again, uh, we don't always see the reflection events, but 
but we can see the refractions. We can use the refraction time intercept uh, uh, or even the crossover distance here in order to estimate thicknesses as we go down. So this would be the, the typical situation that you would get in a two-layer case, uh, three-layer case rather. But if we start to thin this layer, so we thin the thickness of the second layer from 9 meters to 6 meters, you can see that the extent of the critical refraction from the base of layer 1 becomes restricted to about 18 meters in um, a distance, source receiver offset. So unless we had geophones at uh, 3 meter, 5 meter intervals, very likely we might be in this region where we might miss this refractor. So, uh, but at least uh, as we've shown it here in this data, we would uh, see both refraction events, uh, the refraction from the base of layer 1, the refraction from the base of layer 2. We should be able to carry out our analysis successfully and uh, uh, calcul accurately calculate the depth to the uh, second refractor. So, uh, just notice that when we thin the layer from 9 meters to 6 meters, we've actually moved this refraction event up and the uh, uh, point of tangency is closer towards the, the surface. We had much greater exposure of the refraction from the base of layer 1 uh, when this layer was 9 meters thick. Now here we continue to thin the layer. We're thinning it down to uh, three, meter, 3 meters. It's come down from 3 meters from 9 meters to 6 meters to 3 meters, and this is what our data looks like. Now the refraction from the base of layer 1 is barely visible. It only spans uh, source receiver offsets of 4 meters. So this would be very easy to miss unless you were just, unless you had, you know, geophones every meter or every 2 meters. Even 2 meters might not be enough because you'd see the direct arrival here and you'd see the critical refraction here. So you'd have one measurement on the refraction from the base of layer 1. Very unlikely that you would accurately uh, uh, infer the presence of this uh, critical refraction here. And uh, so what kinds of problems are you going to get into in the analysis here? <clears throat> so the problem is much like the previous problem in that we have a V1 and a V3. Uh, we can get our V1 from the direct arrival and our V3 from the critical refraction which is coming in along the base of layer 2. So if we use the refraction time intercept approach, for example, uh, we have a, a time intercept in here which is 0 0.0066 seconds. We have our V1 and our V3. We estimate a thickness of, well, I say H1, but a total thickness of layers 1 and 2 equal to 4.25 meters when the actual thickness is uh, 6 meters. This gives us an error of 30%. In this case, we've underestimated the thickness. In the previous case, with the uh, velocity inversion problem, we overestimate. So, in a nutshell, that has been the layer too thin and the velocity inversion problems, uh, the kinds of errors that you can run into when you're working with data and uh, you're missing a layer, either because of a velocity inversion or because it's too thin. Um, so what we're going to do next time is we're going to take a look at the dipping layer refraction problem and you might uh, go to your textbooks and review this uh, this problem and think about how, uh, how you would handle it and then we'll uh, summarize the, the basic uh, results of this problem. Uh, next time um, we have the source up dip in this case. What if the source were down dip? So take a look at this, and uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.